for both the presiding Ellen, uh, elder, Mary Ellen Baylor, as well as myself. Um, so I want to share that with you and invite you once again. So if you're on SPRB, there's an SPRB meeting today after church up in the conference room. Okay, any final announcements? As we move into the, the time of worship, uh, now is the time for the lighting of the candles. Let us stand, if you're able, and we'll start out with our call to worship. From the ends of the earth, Bless God, the holy name. from the deepest valley and the highest mountain, Bless God's holy name. from the greatest ocean and the fastest river, Bless God's holy name. in our singing and in our praying, in our coming in and going out. Bless God's holy name. Amen. In everything we are, bless, bless God's, God's holy name. name. Let's lift our voices in song, and I know we are few, so you just have to lift your voice that much higher. So let's praise our God together by singing, He is exalted. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him, He is exalted for Oh! 
Lord, we are here singing from the depths of our hearts, if not with our voices. But we are here for you, Lord. We are here to lift you up in our prayers and in our praises and in our communing with you a little bit later on and in our sharing. Lord, we ask that you grow us through this, that you keep us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Last week we um, started the celebration of stewardship and we lifted up the wonderful meditation by Donna about the stewardship of our presence. Anybody remember that sharing? I, I, I seem to recall that I started sniffling and rubbing my eyes furiously um, as she shared. Um, and I think one of the most moving things was that it was moving to her. Um, and therefore, it was sort of the sense of authenticity and truth that she was sharing that we lift up. And why do we do that? Um, Stephen got home last week and he said, thank you for putting that message in the messenger, by the way. He's like, for the first time after going to church for almost all of my life, I think I get kind of a new perspective on stewardship. I actually can say what it is now. We've been doing that, both celebrating it within worship, but also offering you a, just a little word so that you can go home and think about it. Now, last week we began with thinking, ah, oh, stewardship just about money, right? And how our minds kind of go to that place. Um, so I decided to actually find an article that might address that today. So I do invite you to, in your time, to notice um, the Messenger article entitled, Is Stewardship Just About Our Money? Ironically or not, um, I've invited Ben to share a word today about our stewardship of gifts. Now, we think about our gifts in two ways. I would lift up our spiritual gifts, the belief and the affirmation that we all have God-given gifts for the good of the whole, that are to be used for the good of the whole, um, as well as resources, gifts like money to be used. And if we think about our stewardship as a whole life expression of faith in God, then the invitation today is to meditate on how do we, in fact, utilize our gifts in the ways God might use them. So I invite you to pause for a moment and sing this song as a reminder that we come to the um, thinking and the meditating and the acting on stewardship from that place of gratitude in our hearts. Let us sing together, thank you, Lord. thankful for your presence here, actually. I, I guess Donna's sharing must have worked because I know there's a lot of reasons why you might not be here today. <laughs> Just the, the weather and the, the traffic and people being out of town and you having that extra hour to sleep might have, I was tempted to just say, let's sleep for another hour past that. <laughs> so so I so thank you for your presence here today, um, being good stewards of your presence. I, I appreciate it totally. Um, but today we're talking about this uh, stewardship of our gifts. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of reflected on whether I was, I was supposed to focus on the gift, uh, uh, gen gifts in general or gifts of money. So I'll say a little bit about both. Um, I, in my life, um, the, one, one of the m more surprising gifts uh, that I've been given, because God is the big giver, right? God has given everything. But one of the, the gifts that came specifically to me is the, is the gift of music. Now, um, I don't know how many of you um, uh, took music lessons at some point in your life and dabbled in it and whatever. I, I went through the same thing. I guess I can, I'm grateful to my parents for putting me through music lessons. But um, uh, I guess I decided to do a little bit more with that in the church. 
um, because the opportunity was there, and I thought, you know, this is a this is a gift that I need to serve with. This is something that is moving to me, um, and that decision. This was probably I'd say high school time when I started. If you didn't know, I, I actually took organ lessons for some point when we used the organ more during worship, and so I I uh, I learned to play the organ for a couple years, and then we did the band thing. So. Um, yeah, you know, at that time I didn't know exactly what it, it was. Just me, you know, my gift of music. It's, it's something I can do, but I, and I, I reflect back on that as now it's been like 20 years since, and I thought, boy, where is that? Uh, how how has that gift actually um, um, changed my life through the giving? Because I could have just sat back and just said, oh, I just do music for myself I'm, and and just sort of keep it dormant. So. Um, and I thought, well, one of the big things is that if I, if I hadn't done music, um, I might not have met Ari, actually. <laughs> I might not be married today uh, because Ari and I met through our love of music and of serving the church in music. Um, and just even doing music together is an uplifting experience. It, it, driving in today and, and into work, I'm, I'm always listening to uh, praise songs because that, that, that feeds my soul in the morning. It gets me going. Um, and so I'm just thankful that the music is there, and I'm, I'm, I'm growing through that. Um, now, about, about the gift of money, it's actually kind of related to music, because um, through, the, um, or, or be, through our wedding, if for most of you know, is that um, Ari and I decided to redirect the normal wedding, wedding gifting to, the, to start the the building of the school in Uganda. And that was just kind of a off, off the, the, top, the top of my head type, type of thing. I, I didn't even really think about it too hard. It, when, it's kind of the, one of the first things I, I came up with when it came to, to the wedding planning because I thought, you know, we're gonna get all these, these gifts, but I don't really need these gifts. And I, it's not that I didn't want to deny people the, the joy of giving something to me, but I thought, boy, this is a real opportunity to redirect those gifts. And at that time, I didn't really have any plan for what might happen. And it, um, I, I say we were truly blessed by the, the amount of money that people gave through our wedding to, the, to start the, the effort for building the church. Um, it was in the order of tens of thousands, and that was, that was a, a, a huge blessing to begin with. But then we fast forward to today, um, and I guess I should have I should have put up a picture of the of the school itself because the school itself is looks like it's it's finished it's not actually finished but you would be uh, impressed because I, I you know just well, well see Ari and I were married in 2006 so in just four years um, the school went from becoming the dream that was on paper to actually a, a complete structure and that that it just amazes me. Um, how, how a simple thing like um, the gift of our, our wedding turned into that. Uh, we didn't really expect that to happen. I didn't expect it in four years because I'm, I'm, I'm a doubter. I'm, I'm, a, I'm anxiety. Uh, I, I worry about, well, what's going to happen? Maybe it'll just disappear. Maybe it'll be abandoned. And, uh, geez, in just four years that, that appeared. So, so I, I, and, and I, I kind of trace it all back, and I say, you know, it, it kind of all started with being willing to serve uh, the Lord with music somehow. So it's really kind of an amazing story. Mm -hmm. um, I thank God for that. Thank you, Ben. So I invite you to take in the sharing of Ben. I think the one thing that struck me was the sense of um, how, um, if we can go back to the former slide, the, the sense that when, when we give, it's not, it's not, you know, sometimes we feel like things are leaking out from us when we give. But it's sort of, I thought it was very sweet how Ben shared that when he gave the gift of music, lots of things came back to him. One of the th biggest things being partnership, right? Um, that's never, you don't think, I'm going to share music in church so I can find me a bride, right? I, I don't think that that thought was in Ben's head, or Aries for that matter, <laughs> in all the years that she's been sharing that. Nor that we can actually um, be a part of building something much, much greater than ourselves. One of the things that I want to invite you to do is on, to take one of these sheets that I'm going to pass out. And if you can take one and then pass it on to those. If, um, these you might think of as uh, for per family or per household. 
Um, but I actually invite you to do them as individuals. So <clears throat> if you could just take one. You'll see that it's a response card. You, um, you might be familiar from having worshipped here at CCUMC before from seeing a stewardship pledge card that is about yay big. Um, and every year it invites you to fill that out around this time of year. Through conversation with Pastor Sam, um, we began to think about stewardship and part of our message has been and will stay consistent that stewardship is so much more than just thinking about our money. But it is about our whole lives. And so how do we create a response card that actually captures and affirms that? And so this is our best attempt. Now you may uh, fill it out this year and say, I would like to make some changes to make this form better. Please, by all means, uh, bring it on, friends. Um, but I invite you, because on the 21st, I will invite you to return these. And um, we will offer them on the altar uh, one by one. So part of it is really a question. I don't know what the answers are about how to step it up in your presence and your prayers and your gifts and service and witness. Um, so part of it is just offering some ideas. Ben talked about sharing the gift of music, being present with what brings life to him, right? Um, and how best to do that. We can think about all different ways. So I'm going to invite you on the 21st to use these next two weeks to really sit with in your prayer life this form. To ask yourself, how is God calling me to think about these areas? Now, there's a, there's a part that says other, right? You might not check anything on those things. You might think, in my prayer life, these things don't really, what's offered there doesn't speak to me. It's not, it's not, I'm not hearing that for myself, right? But what I am hearing through my prayer is this. So write that in, right? There is no right answer. It's just an invitation. The other thing that I want to say is some people have told me, Emily, if you use this form, everybody is going to freak out and leave, right? Um, that there's a sense of like, wow, we're really talking about, you. you're really asking for a lot. Are, are you sure um, you can put this out? So what I want to say about that is, um, again, I, I stand um, for the sense that this is an invitation. And the invitation really is one that comes from God and that um, as a community, we have the ability to hold each other and support as well as accountability for how we live our lives. And so it's no more and no less than that. And so I invite you to really um, treat it gently and faithfully, prayerfully as you go. And again, on the 21st, I will uh, ask for it back. As a way to be good stewards of our gifts, this is paper, it's a resource. Um, if you do not need an extra one by then, please use the one that you hold in your hands right now rather than getting a second one. However, if you don't have one today and you lose it, you, you I don't know, use it for firewood or whatever and you would like a second one, by all means, ask. Thank you so much. Let us share this prayer in unison as a close to our time meditating on stewardship. Nurturing God, your, your love, love is, is free, free your, your compassion, compassion unconditional, unconditional, and your, and your mercy, mercy infinite. infinite. You shower upon us gifts abundant. Grant that we may know and trust these gifts, that we may discover the joy they bring, and inspire us to serve and to love out of that joy. In the name of the Generous One, Amen. The scripture lesson for today is from the book of Psalms, chapter 145, verses 1 to 5 and 17 to 21. You can find it in your pew Bible on page 581 of the Old Testament, or you can read along in the PowerPoint. The greatness and the goodness of God. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous work, the Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. 
The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth, who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. This is the word of God. <clears throat> for come on up, Richard, and get yourself ready. It was not planned for um, Richard to be preaching on the day that all the women would be away. Um, and I, I apologize now to Richard. Um, so, uh, in order to help Richard, I do invite you if you would want to move closer to him so that he might feel that folks are around him versus far, far away. If you'd be willing to do that, please do so. But I invite you to be open to the message that Richard brings today. I also want to alert Derek to the fact that um, Richard would like to be able to go back to the scriptures during uh, his message, and so please be ready to accommodate. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. God of all miracles and eternal word, bless us all as we strive to strengthen our faith. Help us to serve our brothers and sisters through goodness and in grace. Offer our talents and our gifts to spread your word mission of our church community and the world. We declare your wonderful miracles to all God's people. Amen. Well, today I get to examine Psalm 145, verses 1 through 5 and 17 through 21. It seems like I always get things in sets of two. You know, first it was fishing, now it's songs. I also like to mention uh, best wishes to the women's retreat and all those that were able to go and enrich their lives through prayer and sh sharing their faith. God bless them. I hope you remember my last communication. It was on Psalm 80, always faithful. Uh, again, in Psalm 145, it takes in always faithful in praise, that we are praising God for all the wonderful things he makes available to us. Praising God for everlasting faith in us. David does this so well, expressing praise and glory to God. He relates his human experience, his relationship with God for the glory of God. The psalm was probably written 1440 BC, as most psalms were. To help you, I've taken the liberty to define my understanding of each verse since the scripture was short today. Um, I would describe my understanding of how David Psalm 145 applies to my experience and my relationship to God. Verse one, I will extol you my God and King and bless your name forever and ever. This describes praise. His, my personal adoration and affection for God. The experience is eternal. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. David's praise is not just limited to Sundays, but to every day. He describes love and praise for God as a daily issue. Thanking God for the multiple blessings we receive. Verse 3. Greatness is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, his greatness is unsearchable. God's good, goodness and mercy are universal. Spreading God's riches and glory abundantly. Verse 4. One generation shall lord your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. From father to son, the stories will be told.
mighty acts of God. Verse 5. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will mediate. It is strange that uh, David, who was a king himself, describes the majesty of the king of kings, telling the meaning of praise and adoration for God. We skip to 17 through 21. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. God's ways and works are holy, merciful, and magnified in justice. <coughs> Verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call him and to all who call him on in truth. Prayers are heard for those that are true in heart. With prayer shall always be by his side. Verse 19. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Holy hearts with will desire only holy, and God will gladly fill those desires. He is ever attuned to hearing the cries of the children of God. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. God cares for all and does not tolerate evil. God loves all who believe in the Lord and protects them. Verse 21, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Praise is not limited to just David. Every one of God's children can unite to glorify God's name forever. As followers of God, we need to express our praise for his work. God has always been faithful, as described in Psalm 80. In Psalm 145, we give God praise for his everlasting love. I took the liberty to use the Book of Discipline to describe God. The definition of God in Webster's Dictionary was, to me, quite disappointing. Describing God as any various beings conceived as supernatural, immortal, having special powers over the lives and affairs of people. So I used the Methodist Book of Discipline. I quote Article 1, page 66, God. We believe in the one true, holy, and living God, eternal spirit who is creator sovereign, preserver of all things visible and invisible. He is infinite in power, wisdom, justice, goodness, and love, and rules with gracious regard for the well-being of all, and I change that word from men to people. To the glory of his name, we believe one God reveals himself as the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, distinct but inseparable, eternally one in essence and power. Wow, is that a description of my belief in God? It never ceases to amaze me how many people can take words and put them into a description. So impactful. However impacting that definition was, it is our own individual relationship with God that sends us out to do the work of disciples. Jesus Christ. We are amazed at all of God's miracles, never ending and everlasting. Now, you heard Pastor Emily last week transforming encounters. Remember how the tribe took the wrongdoer and placed him in the middle 
of the community circle. And they only said good things about him. They told good st stories. Whether they were a part of the congregation, whether you're a part of the congregation or up here telling stories of your interpretation of the word, you are serving. Remember how she spoke about Zacchaeus, the crooked tax collector, whom Jesus stayed with. Zacchaeus this demonstrated inward change by outward action, transforming, I will give away half of all I own. I will make right. Once one has taken Jesus into their hearts, stewardship becomes easy. Serving and stewardship takes many forms. It means placing God's will and the good of others ahead of ourselves and our personal desires. Whatever you call yourself, or if you identify yourself as Christian, we are called to serve. Again, I reference the Book of Discipline. Page 91 and 92, section four, servant ministry. Christian discipleship. The ministry of all Christians consists of privilege and obligation. The privilege is the relationship with God that is deeply spiritual. The obligation is to respond to God's call to a holy living in the world. In the United Methodist tradition, these two dimensions of Christian discipleship are wholly interdependent. Now that hits home. I must ask myself, how do I define my intention to celebrate and give thanks for God's generosity through the practice of stewardship? Remember last week's message, messenger? Uh-oh, they want more money. Really, it's not all about money. Christian stewardship is about a way of life. I was very fortunate to have grown up in a Christian family. As a small child, I can remember going with my parents to Bridgeport, Connecticut. This is where I was exposed to a missionary who was named Miss Bray, a person that gave her entire life to missions a small framed elderly woman that had a wonderful personality, a wonderful look about her face. Her eyes were deep and she always had that look of extreme compassion. I believe she was in her late 80s and retired for many years when I first realized she was a special lady. However, we spent many Thanksgivings with her. She attracted many visitors uh, on that holiday, and there must have been thousands of Chinese immigrants which became Christian because of her ability to spread God's word, or her, her ability to tell stories. She spent many hours and many years devoted to God and the Chinese community. She apparently brought good news to hundreds of immigrant workers in the early 1900s. I would describe her as good, gracious, loving, and warm. She was definitely a person that cared and was blessed with wonderful stories that she shared generously, truly a gift bestowed upon her by God. I definitely was guided to the path of God through my parents and Miss Bray. I learned to enjoy the stories about her relationship with God. Whatever her favorite psalm was in the Bible, the stories of self-sacrifice, love, bravery, ritual, creation, romance, song, poetry, and hundreds more. My Christian values today were formed by those wonderful experiences. 
Does anyone know what a steward looks like? I would like to pass around a picture of them. Charlie, could you help me? If you, if you don't mind, take a look for yourself. <laughs> see if you see something similar in what Charlie is passing around. Isn't that a wonderful picture? <laughs> My recollection of Sundays and church began when I was a small child. Going to the city from where I lived, about 50 miles east of Chinatown, New York City. I had always tried to make the journey with my mom and dad, uh, driving along the Belt Parkway or the Southern Expressway from Long Island to New York City. I was a typical kid, uh, pretty easy to satisfy, <laughs> enjoyed Sundays as an outing with my parents taking trips out of my hometown and being with my family was fun and interesting. I also enjoyed listening and learning from both my Methodist Sunday School teachers and my, uh, in First Church Methodist Church in Baldwin, New York, and my ba Baptist missionary folks who taught at Trusting God Church on Elizabeth Street in Chinatown, New York City. My Sundays were filled with time spent at two churches. Sunday school at the Methodist Church began at 9 o'clock and ended around 10. So I'd rush my sister to rush me home so I could hop in my mom and dad's 1950 Packard Woody and ride to Chinatown. We had to make it there by 1 o'clock. It was there I listened to Chinese sermons sitting on hard wooden chairs, most of them learning my Cantonese or say yep yeah, at the Baptist Church. Be being from the suburbs of Long Island, going to the city was always a treat, especially if we were to Nyem Cha. That was the New York saying for California's dim sum. My heritage taught me to respect family and my parents, a typically hardworking mom and dad who earned a living through a Chinese laundry, working long hours, six days a week, and taking Sunday as a day to be with God and the church family. This is where they connected with their heritage and to praise God. I was exposed to prayer as early as I can remember because my mom and dad would not let us touch a morsel of food before saying grace. And saying grace, uh, Prayers before bed was automatic. My parents spoke to us mostly in Chinese. Uh, as most Chinese families, uh, getting out of the house as a young child was pretty hard to do. So if it was related to church, I could go. If it was related to a church outing, like bowling, uh, church basketball, in those days, I mean, if you didn't belong to a church league, you just weren't in the in crowd. And we played basketball for hours and hours. Just like over at Lincoln School, you can see those kids still playing basketball hour after hour till 10 o'clock at night. Uh, unlike uh, a lot of Chinese families that I observed, there was no playing cards, there was no mahjong, there was nothing related to gambling in my dad's house or he would get extremely upset. I was definitely raised in a small town environment. I could go to Sunday school or go to school, but before I got home, my mom and dad knew exactly what my conduct was and how I observed my family's upbringing and displayed myself in the community. I was the only Chinese kid in, in town, and going to Chinatown to relate to my friends, my other Chinese friends, was greatly appreciated. It was there that I met James and Ray uh, Lau, who happened to be also Marines. Uh, James uh, was a company commander 
of H Company, 3rd Marines, and his brother Ray was an intelligence officer. They both served in Vietnam at the same time that I did. And they had counseled me many, many times about going into special operations. And that once I made a commitment to recon, that would be a life-changing experience. How true that was. Because in my early experiences as a fellow Christian and the drives to New York City and Chinatown with my family, I think that's the reasons why I'm a Christian today. And I think those experiences were also life changing. Sunday was devoted to doing God's work. First Sunday school, then worship service. And then my parents were engaged in the goings on of the church administration. The Baptists, not to say that the Methodists aren't just as good, but the Baptists always had somebody that was great at telling stories, to capture the imagination of the children, to keep them engrossed in the Holy Spirit. There were many, many people that provided stewardship. The teachers were magnificent storytellers. I still remember my parents watching them in their church interactions and enjoying the fellowship with their friends. They set the standards for me as good stewards. My exposure to Christian upbringing was due to the guidance of my parents and the stewardship of many Sunday school teachers, the volunteers and chaperones of the youth events, the people who spent many hours coaching and being youth advisors at MYF, and the pastors who engaged in equipping the disciples. I'm very thankful for God for my childhood and my ability to grow up in a Christian environment. Therefore, it's easy to live a life of stewardship. I look forward to serving others instead of serving my own personal desires. Sacrifices are easy to make when you know it's for the good of others. Please go and be good stewards and do share your personal experiences and relationships about God. By the way, was that person that you saw in the picture Anyone that you know? If you didn't recognize that person, please look deeper. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Let's respond by standing up and, and singing, Rise up, ye saints of God, and not, uh, uh, O men of God. So whenever you see, O men of God, rise up, ye saints of God. 576, red hymnal, if you would, if you would rise up.